there is an extremely strong wavelength dependence uh, of focus in the human eye. And the chromatic aberration refers to this wavelength dependent focus. Uh, because of the fact that the eye is made out of water, uh, when there's a point at uh, far away, the focal length uh, where the point is brought into good focus is at different distances. Uh, bluish light, short wavelength light, is brought into focus uh, in front of the retina. The middle wavelength light is brought into focus on the retina, and the long wavelength light is behind the retina. Now you might ask yourself, well, can I just willfully change my uh, accommodate, change the uh, muscle pull on my lens so that I bring the short wavelength into good focus? And as we'll see as we get into the nervous system and the properties of the retina, in fact, you can't. Uh, the nervous system just is not set up to be able to bring the short wavelength light into good focus. And in fact, nearly all of the nervous system is well aware that the short wavelength light or is designed around the idea that the short wavelength light will not be in good focus. And so there isn't really much you can do to make a crisp, sharp image out of very short wavelength light. And this has ramifications throughout the um, imaging industry. So when we look at the retina, the fact that the focus is different for these means that uh, when we look at the retina, the short wavelength light, when it gets there, will be blurred. And this is an image that calculates as a function of retinal position uh, in, in microns how far, how, how much a line will be spread across the back of the eye. And you can see that for a short wavelength light, uh, the expected spread is on the order of plus or minus 20 to 30 microns, really quite quite far. Uh, and at the same moment that the short wavelength light is spread that far, the middle wavelength light, the greenish light, is uh, nice and compressed. It's, it's a compact. And the long wavelength light, which is focused behind, is less uh, compressed. It's spread out a little bit more. And we can measure this in a variety of ways. Some, some for some purposes, we just want to kind of look. And uh, here's an example of what the image will be like at the back of the eye when it's spread in that way. And you, and you can kind of see as you look across a single line like this that there will be short wavelength light spread very far. Uh, that'll leave, since the short wavelength, is, short wavelength light is spread, but the middle and long are not, you can see the, the yellow uh, in the middle reflects that there's relatively more red and green light in the middle over there because the short wavelength light is, has been spread. And you can see that the color changes a little bit as you go for, uh, across here. And uh, if you put in a harmonic, uh, you'll get the same kind of thing where you get these bluish regions over here and the bright regions will look uh, yellowish because of the spread of the short wavelength light. It was just another look in, with a different kind of um, different kind of image. So this is what you put on the screen when you make your nice high resolution, high quality display, you pass it through the human optics, the short wavelength light just spreads everywhere so that these um, narrow white lines over here are rendered as yellow lines with a lot of uh, blue spreading all across the back of your eye. Now you might ask, how do we measure the um, defocus, the relative defocus as you go from one wavelength to another. And uh, there, the experiments to which you do this is basically you take two different wavelengths of light and you insert a lens uh, to uh, create, to, to push the focus of the short wavelength light into the same uh, retinal image plane as the longer wavelength light. And you can ask, well, how powerful a lens do I need? in order to make that short wavelength light uh, come into good focus. And as a function of wavelength, that's what this curve here represents. And these data come from two different sources, Walden Griffin, uh, Walden Nobel Laureate, worked with Griffin um, and made these measurements. 47 Bedford and Rzeski tube, the you know, great uh, color scientists, uh, made the measurements 10 years later. Uh, Tebos made a uh, calculation about what this should be in 1992, and you can see everybody's in good agreement. And the reason why you can get such good agreement is because the basic reason for this is that the refractive power of water uh, differs as a function of wavelength. So you can calculate it and people are all pretty much the same.
If you look at this, this is really a big number here, two and a half diopters. Uh, if you're in perfect focus at, let's say, 570 over here, you need two and a half diopters to correct stuff around 400 or one and a half around 400. And, uh, well, never mind about the ultraviolet. Uh, and you need a good half diopter or more to correct the long wavelength light. Um, if you compare how much variation there is, you know, nearly one and a half, two diopters, uh, as you go across um, the visible light range for the human eye, and you compare that with uh, the chromatic aberration you see in typical shot glasses. Shot is S-C-H-O-T-T, -T, shot glass, for um, different types of, which are commonly used in imaging. You can see that there the range is maybe 0.2 or 0.3 diopters. So these are much flatter. They still need to be corrected. But the human eye, uh, boy, that's, uh, that's a lot of chromatic aberration. Now, as you know, we, we often summarize the properties of optics, not just with the line spread, but to get some more intuition, understand it a little bit better, we'll measure the modulation transfer function. And that's what's shown here. There's a whole series of modulation transfer functions shown for different wavelengths of light. So in the short wavelength light uh, uh, over here, uh, looking on the left side, the short wavelength light, you can see that the drop-off in terms of how much contrast comes through the scaling factor as a function of spatial frequency just drops really, really fast over here. And so at the around 400 to 450 nanometers, you're only getting, oh, somewhere between, you know, three and eight cycles uh, per degree onto the, uh, onto the retinal surface with any contrast at all. When you get to 550 nanometers over here, you're just humming away. You got contrast all the way on out to 30, 40, 50 cycles per degree. And then in the long wavelength regime around 650, you're, you're good out to about 25 uh, cycles per degree. You have, you have some amount of contrast you could pick up. Um, and the two uh, curves are showing you actually the very same data. You're just looking at the surface over here, wavelength, spatial frequency. You're looking at this surface from one side, and here it's been rotated around, so now you've got spatial frequency here and wavelength over here, and here you're looking at the long wavelength side. Again, you can plot these those line spreads that I showed you as images a few a few minutes ago, just as spread and, and as graphs like this, where this is the short wavelength spread, and this is the middle wavelength spread and the long wavelength spread. And in this case here, you can see that the spread is as I, you know, you can quantify it with these curves. Uh, then the short wavelengths, the stuff spreading maybe you know, 20, 30, 40 microns on either side of the line, whereas in the um, middle wavelengths, the spread is confined to you know, plus or minus 3, 4 microns like that, and then a little bit uh, spread a little bit more in the long wavelengths.